<clears throat> Hi, I'm Alex Paulton. and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Talking Time Pieces, where we talk about watches and uh, horology. Today, we're going to talk about a watch that caused a lot of controversy when it came out and is still uh, both looked on with... Uh, amazement in some senses, uh, respect, and some with derision. And I'm talking about Seiko's Spring Drive. Uh, today we'll take a look at the first Seiko Spring Drive, which was put out under the Seiko name. Uh, they withdrew all of it into um, Grand Seiko, but uh, the first Spring Drive was uh, Seiko. And frankly, uh, there are things about it that I wish uh, Seiko had retained. And uh, we'll talk about that when we flip the camera around. So uh, here we are up close with the uh, SNR003 Seiko Spring Drive watch. It was the first Spring Drive, came out uh, between 2005 and 2010, initially in Japan and was released in other places. Um, it's interesting to see because the Spring Drive movement is essentially the same in this as our, in the uh, Grand Seiko models with the uh, five series movements. Um, actually, any of the 30 jewel spring drive movements are all pretty much related based upon finish at that level. Now, uh, if you notice, it's got the power reserve indicator. The, the pivot, the axis is in the same place as in all of the others. It's just that now it goes kind of counterintuitively down and up on that side, whereas if you notice, the, the power reserve indicator on this first generation spring drive is large, plain, and obviously marked. Let's zoom in a little bit. You can see it says, um, oops, too, too far, too far, too far. Let's see how far back we can get this thing to lock in. I've got a new camera on order too, uh, have no fear. So um, it goes all the way up to 72 here. So if you look, it actually gives the number of hours very plainly, whereas the new spring drives with the smaller indicator do not. But I think in this case, since was this, this was the first spring drive, um, they really wanted to emphasize that it was driven by the manual movement, the manual spring in this. And the only real difference between this and a high horology mechanical watch is the escapement itself. Um, I think Seiko made a mistake in not keeping a spring drive within the Seiko line. Uh, this retailed originally around 2500 bucks, if I'm not mistaken, and is still currently worth between uh, 2500 and 3000 So it's uh, not lost any real value, and it's a nice-looking watch. Uh, I'm going to pick it up off the stand in a second and do some turns, but uh, I wanted everybody to get a nice, stable look at it and look at that beautiful sweep uh, we're going to flip it over and take a closer look at the movement and talk a little bit more about that and why that's such a smooth sweep because of the nature of the escapement. But the whole uh, thing about the spring drive that uh, Seiko wanted to emphasize is that this is a mechanical watch. It has an electromechanical escapement, uh, but it is driven by the winding of the spring as a indicator for the spring's uh, power reserve. It's emphasizing that this is a spring-driven watch. Now, um, <clears throat> here we go. Let's take a quick look-see at the uh, diameter while I have it bolted down. Makes it a little bit easier. And we got a 40, say about a 42. Um, We'll measure the thickness in a second. And also it has a very intriguing shape. When uh, we get it up, you'll take a look at that. Uh, one thing I did uh, want to uh, show is how fast the uh, power reserve goes up. It's a very efficient winding mechanism. So um, even though I have a winder case, I uh, tend to leave this one off um, because it's easy to keep an eye on it with the uh, power reserve and top it off when needed. So uh, here we go. Let's uh, pick it up a little bit and uh, take a look-see. Let's zoom out a little bit. Okay. 
So now um, the th case is a very interesting shape. It's almost like shaped like a, a Duncan ring, um, butterfly or a spool, flat spool. Um, but it very intriguing. So it's got a lot of textures and angles, but the very robust lugs uh, give it an air of sportiness as opposed to, you know, weirdness. And the way the um, bracelet integrates very nicely, it's uh, solid end lugs. Um, we'll, we'll take another look at it. I'll uh, flip it over more carefully. And the bracelet itself, um, my audience knows I am not a big one on bracelets and straps and the like. I like to play with NATOs. I like to throw leather on, whatever happens to work. But you could really tell that they put some time, thought, and effort into this. It's got a high polish on the edges. It's got brushed center links. But then it's got this intriguing little bevel. So it catches light and throws it at you. So one of the things about uh, Seikos in general is their polishing and their uh, interesting use of polishing and the angles. And this does not disappoint in that uh, way. Everything that's not brushed is polished to an incredibly high sheen. Uh, and I wouldn't even call that coin edging. That's just beautiful vertical brushing that just really comes across very, very well. And uh, so here we are back in the front. You can see that power reserve indicator with the hours listed. Uh, the date window is very nicely framed. Um, I wish they could have gotten a little bit better color match in the uh, date, but it's pretty far back there. And um, which tells you it's a, a deep movement in one sense. Uh, again, that beautiful sweep is just gorgeous. So um, there's a little dot makes it look like a microscopic Death Star on that very nicely finished crown. The attention to detail is incredibly high. Like I said, I'm surprised they didn't keep uh, this series alive as a Seiko product. Um, the one failing about it that I don't like is a sports luxury watch should have loom. If you're going to say you're sporty, you got to have loom. Even if it's just little pips and some token loom on the hands, if you're in the, you know, crack of dawn in a hotel and you're traveling and you just want to look at your damn watch and know what time it is without having to b blind yourself on the LED display on the clock at the bedside or whatever. You just want to know what the dang time is and it's late at night and you can't see the dial and there's no loom. It can be frustrating. Um, now, on the other hand, that beautiful polishing it really, really catches what light there is and throws it at you. So in that sense, it is a nice uh, dial presentation. <clears throat> now, uh, the clasp, it's a double fold clasp. So uh, not really a lot of opportunity to adjust. Uh, there are half links. I already pulled a half link on this. Uh, so it's either going to be a little tight or a little loose. Um, the mechanism is very nice and clean. It's a well done bracelet. And as I was saying, I just like the design. It's well done. So here, let's take a look here into the back of it. Let me adjust some of the lighting. Okay. So you can see it's well done. Okay, there we go. You see the two holes at about the 10 o'clock and the uh, two jewels there? Those are the um, wheels of the escapement. 
And as you can see, they're moving in a constant uh, direction and at a pretty decent clip because since it's an electromagnetic escapement, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, a little bit more about that in a second. Since it's an electromagnetic escapement, there is no direct physical contact on these wheels to slow them down. They're slowed by magnetic force. So, um, and the uh, finishing is very, very nice. Again, um, they really did a nice job on the finishing of this movement. It uh, stands on its own with anything else in its caliber put out by anybody else in the industry, I would argue. So, um, beautiful looks, great movement, nice case. I don't know why uh, Seiko didn't pursue this uh, further within the Seiko line. They, uh, as you know, uh, bumped up the spring drive to Grand Seiko, and now it's starting to trickle down into prospects and um, potentially other Seiko lines. But uh, it started with Seiko, and I think it should have stayed with Seiko. They could have made Grand Seiko versions, and then that would have also uh, given them multiple price points with the technology. So those are my thoughts on the, uh, oh, uh, before I uh, get, let you go, let's do a quick, I, I had promised the thickness. Thickness is 12 and a half. It's quite svelte. And I'll tell you what, I have taken these lugs off, but this thing is a pain in the you-know-what to uh, put on. But it's a 21 uh, roughly uh, lug width and frankly, with this bracelet, I would just leave this bracelet on. And that's coming from uh, someone you know who loves to play with uh, bracelets and straps. I'm, I had it off, and it was such a nuisance. I just put this one back on and just decided I'm just going to go with it. I mean, in one sense, it is the quintessential uh, blue face sports watch, except for the lack of loom. And I, I, I do think Seiko made a mistake. Now, the spring drive itself, that electromagnetic clutch, is uh, essentially like a reverse motor. So instead of driving the motor with uh, electricity, it's literally using the electricity to slow the spinning wheel, the already spinning wheel, because it's being driven by the spring. Uh, the already spinning wheel... I'll let you all look at that while we talk a little bit about that aspect of it. Okay. That, um, as, as if you know about uh, watches and how they function, th all of the energy is stored in the spring and the escapement allows that energy to be released slowly. In this case, that energy from the metal spring, the physical energy, the potential energy in the spring that's being released, uh, as kinetic energy is then slowed down by this magnetic clutch, this uh, reverse motor, as I was saying, and it's being controlled by a quartz crystal. So the uh, braking mechanism is not contact, phys no physical contact, and it's being um, controlled by uh, 30,000 plus uh, frequency uh, quartz oscillator. So that's how you get this beautiful sweep. There's uh, no reason for it not to be a beautiful sweep because uh, there's nothing holding it back. It's not ticking in that sense because it doesn't need to tick. And uh, since it's continually being um, adjusted, it's incredibly accurate. Now, a lot of people say that because there's a quartz element in it, since there's an electronic element in it, it's not a quote unquote uh, real watch in that sense. And uh, they disdain it. Uh, and to that I say, well, you're welcome to feel that way, but it is still it is still a f significant hor horological feat, just like the uh, Bulova Accutron, uh, both the past version with the tuning fork and the present version with the electrostatic mechanism or for example um, Seiko's uh, kinetic technology where the the weight drove a uh, generator to power or uh, to charge a capacitor which then drove the quartz circuit but hybrid watch technologies are not new hybrid watch technologies are not uh, cheap 
Uh, just look at the uh, Rolex Oyster Quartz. That's a true hybrid technology. It uses a quartz um, driven, temperature compensated quartz driven motor to drive a one hertz 11 joule Swiss escapement. Uh, so, a beautiful piece like this with that haunting sweep, it really shows you uh, that you can have a nice uh, watch based on an alternative technology, and it's not going to be some abortion of uh, kluge of mess of technology. I think the spring drive is a good piece and it's worth it. But then again, some of the people who don't like it also don't like uh, spring hair, uh, silicon hair springs in purely mechanical movements like those by Omega. So, you know, um, I, I think that verges on uh, Luddism. But I'm not going to say that they are wrong. If they want to be purists, let them be purists. But then they should be purists in all aspect of that. And then that locks them out from pretty much everybody in the industry except guys who put the stuff together with their own hands. Um, on that note, I'll uh, flip the camera around. Uh, I realize I've been rambling a bit, but I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions about any of this, please let me know. Let's flip the camera around and uh, call it a day. So... That was the uh, Seiko Spring Drive. Really nice design. Um, I think a, a example of a pathway potentially missed, uh, but all in all, a really nice watch. So thanks for taking the time to be with me today, and I appreciate it. And uh, please subscribe. It'll let you know when I have some new content up. Thanks for being with me today, and have a great day.